And joining us now in studio, Dan Gardner, author of Future Babel, Why Expert Predictions Fail and Why We Believe Them Anyway. Dan's also a very fine columnist with the Ottawa Citizen, and it's good to have you in that chair. You and I have spoken many times, but always over satellite. This is mm -hmm. the first time in person. Mm -hmm. Why'd you write this? Uh, well, I suppose the facetious answer would be that, as a columnist, I've always been amazed that I've been unable to predict the future, unlike my colleagues, <laughs> who seem to think that they can. Uh, more seriously, uh, I've always had an historical bent, and I think that if you have a bit of memory, you realize how truly awful experts are at predictions. And yet, you can't open a newspaper or watch a TV newscast without seeing experts making predictions. That's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? And we will talk about why over the course of this discussion. You point to the 1970s as kind of the high watermark of expert yeah. prediction. How so? Oh, absolutely. The 1970s. Let me take you back. 1968, the population bomb, Paul Ehrlich. Uh, what's going to happen in the 1970s and 1980s? Mass global famine. 1973, Robert Heilbroner, inquiry into the prospects of man. What's going to happen? Maoist China or extinction? Those are your two options, okay? Uh, 1974, again, Paul Ehrlich, the end of affluence. What's going to happen? Uh, global depression in addition to starvation, etc. It was a really grim time. Uh, oil prices, we were going to run out of oil. We were going to run out of resources. It was one awful prediction after another. And there's a very good reason for that. Uh, it's not just a coincidence that the 1970s was the golden age of predictions. Bad predictions. Bad predictions, as it turned out, fortunately. <laughs> uh, the 1970s, remember what happened. You had the post-war economic boom right up until basically 1973, when the Arab oil embargo strikes, and the world is plunged into a very terrible recession, and you're into stagflation. Economics has been upended. People don't know what's coming. It's a time of profound uncertainty. And it's uncertainty that's the key to the puzzle here because it's our psychological aversion to uncertainty that propels us to turn to the experts and say, please, we have to know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Tell us. Fill in the blanks. Let Fill us know what's blanks. coming out. Uh, okay, to that end, the Harvard psychologist, Philip Tetlock, yeah. does some experimentation, tracks the record of experts. Tell us what he finds. Yeah, well, this is an essential experiment because if I were to recite bad failed experiments, uh, I wouldn't actually prove that experts are actually bad at making predictions. Of course, you could accuse me of cherry picking, and quite mm -hmm. rightly. What Philip Tetlock did was an essential experiment. It's by far the most comprehensive analysis of expert predictions ever conducted. He brings together a group of almost 280 uh, experts, economists, political scientists, journalists, people who make their living forecasting. Uh, and he asks them the sorts of things to make the sort of predictions which they're always asked to do. What's the inflation rate going to be? What's going to happen with economic growth? Will there be an election? Who will win the election? Will there be a war? Who will win the war? That sort of thing. And in all, he ma amasses about 28,000 predictions over various time frames. And then he waits. He's a very patient man, <laughs> Philip Tetlock. Uh, and then he's able to determine whether, in fact, the predictions were accurate or not. And then he crunches the numbers. And the bottom line on this experiment is pretty shocking. The average expert was about as accurate as random guessing. Or to put that a little more colorfully, they're about as accurate as a flip coin flip or coin. a dart-throwing chimpanzee. Right. Why do, in which case, these are smart people mm -hmm. who make these predictions. I mean, they spend their lives trying to get trained, trying to get knowledgeable so they can make these predictions. Why do smart people make dumb predictions? Well, fundamentally, it's because the nature of the, the reality is unpredictable. Uh, thanks to ideas such as chaos theory, the famous butterfly effect, nonlinearity in complex systems, there is true fundamental unpredictability. We can forecast weather out 24, 48 hours. We can't forecast it beyond five or six days, and we never will be able to. So there's fundamental unpredictability, and many times experts are trying to predict things which simply cannot be predicted. But more fundamentally, it's about the style of thinking. Now, there's an, an extremely important twist in Tetlock's, uh, Tetlock's experiment. Remember I said the average expert is about as accurate as a flipped coin. Some experts were actually worse than average, which is really pretty impressive. Uh, you know, they are worse than a flipped coin, which is pretty, you know, spectacular. Uh, some experts were actually better. They were still miles from perfect, but they had real predictive insight. Now, what was the distinction between the two? It wasn't whether they were left wing or right wing, whether they were optimist or pessimist, or any of the other factors that you might think would cause this distinction. Uh, it was one thing and one thing only, the style of thinking. The experts who were less accurate, the ones who are less accurate than a flip coin, 
they were, uh, Tetlock uses the term hedgehogs, using an old Isaiah Berlin term. He calls them hedgehogs. They know one big idea. They have one analytical tool, and because they're sure that analytical tool is correct, they use it to stamp out predictions over and over again, and they like simple, clear, certain answer answers. They know what's going to happen. Well, the experts who were actually more accurate than average, they were the opposite. They don't have one analytical tool. They have many. They like, they like getting information from diverse sources, and they're comfortable with complexity and uncertainty. They talk about maybe it will happen on the one hand, on the other hand. That's couching it, though. That's not really making a hard, fast prediction. Uh, that's well, saying it could happen. That's right. That's yeah. right. But that's essential because that's <laughs> the nature of reality. <laughs> now, here's the problem. The problem is, as Harry Truman once said, remember Harry Truman said, uh, I want to hear from a one-armed economist. Why did Harry Truman say that? He <laughs> so said, on one hand, on the other hand. He yeah. doesn't want to hear that. You don't right. want to hear on the one hand, on the other yeah. hand. Why is that? Because of that psychological aversion to uncertainty. You don't want to hear on the one hand, on the other hand, maybe it will happen. Mm -hmm. You want to hear it will happen. Here is the answer. But Tetlock's experiment demonstrated that that's actually a disastrous way of going about, uh, going about making predictions. And what he also showed, which is very interesting, is that in fact there is an inverse correlation between fame of experts, the fame of experts, and their accuracy. The more famous the expert, the less accurate they were. Why? Because the media want to hear from the hedgehogs. Okay, let me pick up on that then. If these experts have such a poor track record, and we in the media are supposed to be in the business of putting accurate information to the public, why do we so consistently go to people and say, tell us what's going to happen? Well, a couple of reasons. I mean, fundamentally, it's about the media are giving people what they want. They're giving them the certainty that they crave. The expert who says, I know what's going to happen, not the expert who says, on the one hand, on the other hand, right? That's problem number one. Problem number two, there's no memory. You maybe remember, 25 years ago, the experts had a virtual consensus that Japan was going to overtake the United States and become the world's number one economy. Well, what happened? 1992, Japan gets into trouble. 93, it gets worse. 94, 95, the United States is doing well at this point. Eventually, it becomes clear that Japan's not going to overtake the United States. But by the time that happens, everybody's forgotten about it. And so the rule with expert predictions is heads I win, tails you forget we had a bet. <laughs> And that's why we keep doing this. Absolutely. We, that's how we get away with doing this. Absolutely. What causes our aversion to uncertainty? What's going on up here that makes us averse to that? Fundamentally, the brain is an organism that wants to make sense of the universe. We're wired to do that. We're wired to do that. We're compulsive. It happens automatically. And when you look into the future, and you see swirling chaos, you see a void, you see total uncertainty, that's terrifying. And I want to explain just how terrifying it is. I mean, when I say terrifying, I mean that literally. Researchers asked a group of volunteers to endure electrical shocks. And they took half that group and they said, you will have 20 strong electrical shocks. And they gave that, uh, they took the other half of the group and they said, you will have 17 mild electrical shocks interspersed randomly with three strong electrical shocks. Hmm. And then they wired them to, to, to look for the physiological signs of fear. Elevated heart rate, elevated respiration rate, perspiration, right? Guess what happened? The people who experienced the 20 strong but predictable shocks experienced much less fear than the other group. That's how powerful uncertainty affects us. We need predictability. We need predictability. We're hardwired for it. Um, what are some of the things that we do to try to eliminate uncertainty? If we're so predestined and pre-wired to make sure that life is predictable, what do we do to try to avoid that? Well, one of the interesting findings from the research is that superstition goes up along with uncertainty. Because, of course, if you have the lucky rabbit's foot, you reduce the uncertainty, right? If you believe in these sorts of things. People's interest in astrology goes up in uncertain times. That's one source. Another source of certainty is dogmatic religion. And there's some evidence that in particularly uncertain times, especially dogmatic forms of religion, I'm emphasizing, uh, that uh, uh, interest in those forms goes up. Another form of certainty is conspiracy theories. The 1970s was filled with conspiracy theories, and we're seeing a lot of conspiracy theories starting to flourish now. Why? Because conspiracy theories sweep away the uncertainty and replace it. But now, if you're a sensible, rational person, you don't accept, you don't accept, uh, accept superstition, dogmatic religion, you don't accept uh, conspiracy theories. What's left? How do you get rid of the uncertainty? Experts. 
<laughs> okay, if our brains are hardwired to seek patterns and to seek explanations, and this elicits bad predictions, then presumably what we ought to be doing is just accepting the fact that we live in a world where we just live with unpredictability all the time. So how, do, I mean, give us some advice here. How would you recommend that we go about trying to just live with the fact that this world is going to be a series of random events that, we, that no expert can, can predict appropriately. Well, it's not completely random, I mean, the, uh, the nature of the universe. I, I, I like to use weather as a, as a good model because, as I said, we can pretty accurately forecast 24 hours out, 48 hours out, six days out, forget it, right? So you can have to distinguish between what's reasonable to predict and what's not reasonable. And the other thing you have to do is uh, distinguish between reasonable methods of forecasting and unreasonable methods. And reasonable methods are the, so, uh, the sorts of methods that you hear from the experts you should be listening to. They're the people who say on the one hand, on the other hand, maybe it will happen this way. Listen to Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of Canada, when he delivers an economic forecast. He starts by saying, uh, number one, our previous forecast was wrong. That's important, acknowledging your mistakes and adjusting accordingly. Uh, number two, he says, well, here's our new forecast. But, you know, there are three factors which point in one direction, three factors which point in another direction, and there's a whole lot of uncertainty here. That is a sensible way of grappling with the future. Unfortunately, it's psychologically unsatisfying. We want to hear from the blowhard, to be blunt. Mm -hmm. We want to hear from the expert who says, the answer is this. We have to get over that. Part of accepting uncertainty and unpredictability is accepting the so-called monkey bite factor. You want to tell us what that is? <laughs> yeah, this is a really... Uh, Winston Churchill once referred to a war that happened after the First World War between Greece and Turkey. And he said, a monkey bite killed 250,000 men. He said, how on earth did a monkey bite do that? Well, you have to cha chase back or trace back a, a chain of events mm -hmm. back to a monkey bite. There was the war. Well, what caused the war? Well, there was a change in government in Greece. That was a critical turning point. Well, what caused the change in government? Well, there was a change in the monarch, who was largely a figurehead. Well, what caused the change in the monarch? Well, uh, one day, the king, who was a young man, a young and healthy man, was out for a walk with his dog, and two monkeys attacked his dog. And one of the monkeys bit the king. The, the bite became infected, and it killed the king. So in other words, that chain of events yes. would not have happened if not for the monkey bite. Now, could anybody look at that event, a monkey bites one man, and say, you know what the consequence of this will be? A war in which 250,000 soldiers die. No, impossible. That's chaos theory at work in human affairs, and it makes prediction fundamentally impossible. So what do you want us to do instead? Well, what we have to do when you come, come to making decisions is we have to make decisions that work under a variety of circumstances. You could, we have to explore the future. We have to examine possible futures, but we have to avoid the dangerous allure of thinking that we know what the future will be. Mm -hmm. And so you make decisions that work under a number of different circumstances. In the book, I talk about one of my favorite examples, a carbon tax. A carbon tax, I think, is great policy, even if climate change isn't real. There's all sorts of good things that will happen if it turns out that all the predictions about climate change aren't real. That's a good policy. You're not going to predict that that's going to take place, though. Uh, sadly, no. <laughs> okay, so we know predictions are ridiculous. So who's going to do better this year, the Maple Leafs or the Senators? <laughs> <laughs> the probabilities <laughs> lean in the direction of the Senators, I would suggest. I, I, sad to say, I think you're probably right about that. Although, if you watch just the first four games of this uh, NHL season, you might not have come to that conclusion. True. <laughs> uh, Future Babble is the name of the book. Why expert predictions fail and why we believe them anyway. Dan, good of you to join us here at TVO tonight. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you.